Well, last time we were together in our first uh, week, uh, we kind of finished with this on the seventh day of creation, God rested idea. And so we come out of that last session knowing uh, a couple things that I suggested, knowing that his rest isn't this disengagement without uh, any responsibilities, but it was a full engagement into a functional cosmos that he had given function and order to uh, as its creator and ruler. And so on day seven, when it said God rested, what we see is God leaning in, right? Not backing away. And so it's kind of a paradigm shift from a rest standpoint. So we need to get that into our head. Why, do, why is that important? It's important because we started last week in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10, and there it suggests that the rest, the rest that God experienced on that seventh day of creation is somehow linked to the believer's rest even today, New Testament believer's rest, okay? So it's important we understand what God's rest was because we're going to try to imply that, apply that to how does that, what does that mean for us as we think about rest in our own lives? There is one aspect of lesson number one that I didn't speak to, and I'm going to bring it up now. It was in the questions, uh, if you remember, but um, in Genesis 1-5 is our first account. The, the author uses a repetitive literary device to signify the ending of each day in the creation account. This is Genesis chapter 1. We see it first here in verse 5. Uh, and there was evening and there was morning one day. And this is a literary device that the author uses to just move on, say this is done and now we're moving on to the next thing. Okay, we see it again in uh, verse 8, verse 13, verse 19, Again in verse 23, one for each of the first six days, in fact. And even the last day in verse 31, we see it. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. But I think you noticed out of that first lesson that on the seventh day, he abandons that literary device. There's no evening and morning on the seventh day. And so what does that mean? And I think it's critical that we understand what it means because the author of this account left it out on the seventh day, but included it on every other day. So do you think that's by chance? Do you think he forgot? No, it's not by chance. So he left it out on purpose, and I'm going to suggest to you that it's because the seventh day never ended. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me clarify. Um, literally, did the seventh day end? Yes. How do I know? Because yesterday wasn't the seventh day and I went to bed and I got up and today was a new day. And so literally the seventh day ended, okay? Because we are counting new days, okay? So what do I mean by it didn't end? I'm gonna suggest to you in the same way that that's a literary device that I use for days one through six, he abandons that literary device to suggest that whatever it was that God entered into on day seven didn't come to an end. In fact, it survived day seven. So the real question is, what did God do on day eight? And that tells you that there was a literal day eight, but the answer to that question is, he rested on day eight. And he rested again on day nine and 10 and 11. <laughs> and on to how far? It hasn't ended. That's the point of the creation account. Abandoning that literary device on day seven, it suggests that God entered into his rest, which is what, how have we defined it? He entered, he stopped the creative work and he entered into a functional cosmos that he had put into order and he began ruling. And so from a theological standpoint, what this is saying on day seven is that God began his rule on day seven, and it, it didn't end. It continued on. Okay, again, not disengagement, like we are tempted to uh, make that rest, but it is a full engagement in, as a ruler in an ordered and functioning system. 
And why is that important? Well, who was there with God? Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? And I'm going to suggest to you that Adam and Eve, before the fall, were at rest with God. Not that they were the ruler, but they had been given a place to be, remember this from last week, and a thing to do in the creation. And they were in that place, Eden, and they were doing that thing. Exactly what God had said, subdue and rule, okay, as a co-regent. And so uh, what disrupts that, though? Well, sin does, yeah. Sin disrupts the rest of who? Of God? No, God's still ruling, right? So whose rest is disrupted? It's Adam and Eve, it's humanity's rest that's disrupted. And how do we know that? We know that because Adam and Eve are removed from the place of rest where God rules. And there's little guards put in place so that they don't find the way back into the place of rest. And the punishment that they're given is you're now going to work. Not because they weren't working before. You're going to now go work in a non-functional way, the way that you weren't created to work, it's not, you're not going to be at rest out there. Things are not going to be the same. God's still at rest, though. Okay? And so it sets up this dilemma. This dilemma is, what's God going to do? Because, you know, we as humans, we have bad memories, Right? And if we get too far away from this restful existence that the world was created in, we're going to forget that it even ever happened. And we're going to assume that what we're experiencing now is what God intended. And in fact, I think that's what we find a lot of the world assuming, is the way that the world's functioning is just the way it is. This is a good setup for our next session. This problem.